good to be with you again to study the Word of God. We finished up the book of Nahum, and so as I went through different books and things, I came across a book that I don't think is spoken of very much, maybe certain aspects of it, but uh, I thought we'd go into its entirety, and that's the book of Habakkuk. And so today, we're going to start, kind of give a little bit of an overview, slightly get into the first chapter, and then each, each following week we'll go deeper and deeper. But well, why don't we start with a word of prayer? Dear Holy Father, just ask that you be with us now, as we need your Holy Spirit to guide us through another book, and that is the book of Habakkuk. Help us to understand what he is saying to his audience and the time in which he lives, as well as what are some underlying principles that we can apply to today. So be with us now, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I don't know what do you know about the book of Habakkuk. Um, some of the things you can ask, you know, who is this guy? Where is he from? Uh, who was his audience? There's a couple of different ideas that are out there. Uh, I can show you the uh, prophet timeline that I showed you some time ago. As you can see here, you've got Nahum down in the center that you're familiar with. Nahum is who we just got done doing, as I've highlighted here. And if you look, some of the different ideas that are out there, one is that he was during, uh, Habakkuk was during the time of Manasseh, Ammon, and Josiah. So some think that he was somewhere in this area. Um, if you remember, Nineveh fell around 612 BC. So that would have been under Josiah, toward the end of Josiah's reign. It was a big, huge realignment that happened. Um, if you remember, Josiah was the one that had removed all of Assyria's control, all of the things that were going on, all of the uh, idolatry and high places. He tore them down. Uh, but then at the end of Josiah's life, he well, he ended up being killed um, by an uh, Egyptian king. And we'll look at that in just a moment. But I, I'm not certain. I, I, I don't think it was during Josiah's reign, because as we're going to be reading through this, this was major, major apostasy that was happening in this time. So I, I doubt that it was during Josiah's reign, because again, that was a very time of positive reformation that was happening. Um, as far as Manasseh is concerned, man, maybe... But again, Manasseh, what was he doing to all the prophets? He was killing all the prophets. So I guess there's a potential that he could have survived and done this, but I'm, I'm not likely to accept either that he was during Manasseh's time. It's possible that it could have been Manasseh's son, Ammon, as you can see here. He reigned for about two years before Josiah came in. Um, actually, you can read that if you've got your Bibles. Uh, go to Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 33, Second Chronicles chapter 33, and starting with verse 20. So Second Chronicles chapter 33, starting with verse 20. So Manasseh died, he was buried, and it says his son Ammon reigned in his place, and he was 22 years old when he became king. And he reigned two years in Jerusalem, but he did what? He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, and it goes on to say, as his father had done. But then verse 23 says, And he did not humble himself before the Lord, as his father Manasseh had humbled himself, but he trespassed more and more. Then his servants conspired against him, killed him in his own house, and the people of the land executed all those who conspired against uh, king Ammon, and then the people of the land made his son Josiah king in his place. So I guess it's possible that Habakkuk could have been during this deep apostasy and stuff for these two years, but I'm, I'm still not um, going to accept that. I don't think that's the, the actual uh, situation. I think it, it, it's more in line with the next king. If you notice here, I have got Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. Now, before him was Jehoaz, and he was only there for three months. If you've got your Bible still, in 2 Chronicles 
just go a couple more chapters over to chapter 35. Second Chronicles chapter 35. And there we get uh, Josiah dying and Jehoaz becoming king. But as we just said, three months is all he was in there. And he ended up being taken uh, by Necho. Necho was the king of Egypt. And Necho took him and put uh, Josiah's other son, Eliakim, on the throne. But he changed his name. And this happens all the time. You know, Nebuchadnezzar changed the name of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and all these things. So Eliakim was his name, and he was put on the throne. If you notice there, go one more chapter in Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 3, where it says, Now the king, which is Necho, Necho the second, actually, uh, king of Egypt opposed him, which Jeho has, at, at Jerusalem, imposed the land of tribute for 100 talents of silver and a talent of gold. And then the king uh, of Egypt made Jehoah's brother Eliakim king over Judah and Jerusalem and named, have changed his name to Jehoiakim. And then he carried Jehoaz off to Egypt. And so if you notice here, go down to verse 5. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem and did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against him and bound him in fetters to carry him off to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried off some of the articles from the house of the Lord to Babylon, put them in his temple at, at Babylon. And so it's not far after we're getting, you know, the 605 all the way to 586, when it end up being the destruction of the temple. Uh, it's only like 23 years later, after Jehoiakim comes in, that the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar, you know, takes Daniel and, and Ezekiel. So it's, it's likely that Habakkuk is either a contemporary of Nahum, maybe later in his life, I don't know. Maybe Jeremiah, maybe Ezekiel. Ezekiel was older uh, when, like Daniel was younger, Ezekiel was older. So it could have been Jeremiah, Ezekiel, maybe Nahum. It's, it's really hard to see, but I think it was under Jehoiakim that Habakkuk's message comes out because there was so much apostasy that happened after Josiah in, uh, in 609. As soon as he dies, everything goes downhill until it finally, you know, Judah is taken into exile by Babylon. And when you read the book of Habakkuk with me over the next few weeks, you're going to find that this message that Habakkuk is saying is, is to Babylon. And, and we're going to see that. And it's even speaking of the, the coming of Babylon. So Babylon hasn't gotten there yet. And again, it's a lot of, of apostasy. Um, it's interesting, in the uh, antiquities of the Jews, this was Josephus. He said that Nebuchadnezzar slew Jehoiakim along with high-ranking officers and then commanded Jehoiakim's body to be thrown before the walls without any burial. And Jeremiah actually brings this up in Jeremiah chapter 22, where it says, with the burial of a donkey, he was, uh, was, shall be buried dragged off and thrown out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. So he didn't come to a very good end. None of them did. I mean, all of them had a horrible all the way down to the Zedekiah at the end. Um, it's interesting in the book Prophets and Kings, it says the first years of Jehoiakim's reign were filled with warnings of approaching doom. The word of the Lord spoken by the prophets was about to be fulfilled. The Assyrian power to the northward, long supreme, was no longer the rule, to rule the nations. Egypt on the south, in whose power the king of Judah was vainly placing his trust, there's Necho, uh, was soon to receive a decided uh, check. All unexpectedly, a new world power, the Babylonian Empire, was rising to the eastward and swiftly overshadowing all other nations. So it seems as if uh, Habakkuk is being written in a time when Nahum had sent his message, you think about it, his message was speaking to Nineveh, Assyria, and now you've got Habakkuk speaking to Babylon. It's interesting. Jeremiah 
is speaking to Judah and its people. You know, you got Jonah that's speaking to Israel in the north. You got Nahum who is speaking to the Assyrians in the fall of Nineveh. And now you've got Habakkuk who is speaking to Babylon itself. It hasn't come yet, but it's about to break on the stage. And so that's why I would probably place Habakkuk during this time, as I have highlighted here, uh, during the time of, it could be uh, around Jeremiah, he could be around Ezekiel, uh, he could have been during this time of Jehoiakim, when all of this apostasy for 11 years, or even in reality, once Josiah dies, 23 years until Jerusalem is, is laid waste. And so that's probably where I would place him uh, during this time. So let's go ahead and, and continue this thought and open up our Bibles to Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1. So if you will turn with me to Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1. So it says, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. There the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. So as you go through this, there are some words that I think that you'll pick out here as we go through, but, but Habakkuk is expressing an attitude that probably all of us have, especially as we look in the news and the media and see what's going on in the world around us, are you not outraged at the violence and the injustice that is happening in our society today? I think we would all say yes. And like he says here, he desires deliverance, right? We all desire deliverance. Uh, it's interesting, the same word that is used here for deliver is also used in the book of Judges when it's talking about Gideon. Gideon is about to go to battle. And he puts out the uh, fleece. You remember the story of Gideon putting out the fleece? In Judges chapter 6, verse 36, it says, I'm going to go lay out a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone, and it is dry on all of the ground, then I will know that you will deliver Israel by my hand, as you have said. So this idea of deliverance from evil, this deliverance from injustice and violence, he's about to go to war, and he wants to know that if he does this, and what does God do? God actually diminishes his numbers uh, down to like 300, right? Based against all of these others, thousands in, in war. But Ephesians, it's powerful. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. You see, in, in Gideon's battle, the battle really wasn't about flesh and blood, because who went to battle for him? It was God. God fought the battle for him. And in our lives, so often people think that this battle that we're in is against flesh and blood and all these things that are going on, but that's not really the battle. The battle that you and I are going through is principalities of darkness. It's Satan and the adversaries that are with him that are creating all of this thing that is putting a wedge between us spiritually and God. And so that is so important for us to see that. But if you notice there, there are words that keep getting repeated in verse three and verse four of Habakkuk chapter one. I want to identify them. There are really seven. I've seen different commentaries and others give different numbers, but I went into the Hebrew and I really kind of see seven that I want to identify with you here now. So in verse 3, it says, why do you show me iniquity? Depending on your translation, another one that I see here talks about, must I forever see this sin? Uh, the actual Hebrew word is three words that are used to describe this word in the Hebrew. 
it is trouble, it is sorrow, and it is wickedness. What's interesting is in this Hebrew language, there are going to be several words that are similar, but they're different. It's a totally different word, but some of their uh, interpretation would be similar. Like, for instance, here as it says that you show, uh, why do you show me sin or iniquity? That really is trouble. Why do you show me sorrow? Why do you show me wickedness? Causing me to see, there's another word, trouble, which also means trouble, toil, or labor. It's, and it's twice. And I like how the writer is putting the words next to each other. So it's, it's almost like it's a double meaning in a way. It's saying sin and misery, trouble and trouble, uh, sorrow and sorrow, wickedness and wickedness, toil and toil. It's magnifying the actual situation that, that he has seen. The, the third one goes on to say, for plundering and violence are before me. And really, the, the word is destruction. Uh, havoc, uh, devastation, ruin, violence, uh, and you can see that there. The fourth one, again, you see is, is the word violence, uh, violence or wrong. So think about all of these being magnified worse and worse and worse. Violence, trouble, sorrow, uh, toil, havoc, ruin, wrongs. And then that fifth one, as you will notice, gets down to verse 5, where it says, uh, actually, no, it's verse 4. Uh, it says that Justin, justice never goes forth. It says that the law is powerless. There is strife and contention, and it arises. The actual word there is arise or lift. So some translations, like the New Living Translation, says that the people love to argue and fight. Does that sound familiar? Love to argue and fight. There is strife. There is dispute. There is contention. Man, all of these words that we're describing is the very elements that we see today. Uh, that people are loving to argue and fight. That strife is arising. That it's being lifted up. Um, and then it goes even further and it says, again, as I just read to you a moment ago, that justice never goes forth. Uh, another translation says that no justice is in the courts. Now, sometimes this can be missed. If you notice there in verse 4, depending on your translation, the King James does a good job. New King James does a good job. It says the law is powerless. Actually, that word powerless in the Hebrew is really to grow numb. Notice this, that the law is growing numb. Does that sound familiar too? Uh, for instance, in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, it uses this same word for law. And it says that when the people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. So whenever people do not accept divine guidance, okay, when they are doing what is right in their own eyes, and I'm not talking about professing. I'm talking about authentic followers of Jesus, not the ones that run and hide, not the ones that, you know, deny Jesus as Peter did early on, but the ones that truly do follow him. The ones that truly do accept divine guidance. And so if they're not accepting divine guidance, they run wild. But if they are obedient to the law, they are joyful. Now, does it mean that they're having hardship? Sure. Can you be a lawful person and still go through hardship? Quite certainly. You know, this coming Sabbath, I'm going to be preaching on this very thing. As we look at some other places in Scripture that deal with this. Yeah, the, the righteous do perish along with the wicked. Uh, in the book of Micah, it also uses this same Hebrew word for law that, that it's being used here in Habakkuk. In Micah 4.2, the King James Version says that many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. That's where God is, his presence, his place. And if we go there, he will teach us his ways. 
and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This is so powerful, right? That, hey, if you're not accepting divine guidance and you're doing what you think is right, then you're running wild. But if we come to where God is, we kneel at his feet, and we, that he will teach us and that we will walk in his paths. He will direct us. He will tell us where to go and where not to go. He will tell people like Philip, I want you to go to this desert place. So often in our lives today, people are taking it upon themselves to go. But we should wait for God to direct us. We need divine guidance. If we don't, we just run wild. Another one, as you can see, as a result of this running wild, it says this seventh one, which is also in verse 4, the, King, the New King James really doesn't encapsulate it well. Neither does the King James. Well, King James does pretty good. Um, because the King James says this in verse 4. It says, The wicked doth compass about the righteous. This is powerful. In the New King James, in other words, it talks about them surrounding. Uh, the New Revised, or no, the Lou Living Translation says that they outnumber the righteous. I think it's missing the point here. It's not that they're surrounding them, even though that does have something to do with it. Definitely doesn't mean that they're outnumbering, even though you can see some prophetic things in there. The word compass really is the best, okay? And it is that the just or the righteous are being compassed. Surrounded isn't bad, but I like the word compass because there is a New Testament place where the same word compass is used. I don't know if you thought of it in your mind as I read that word. Let me read it to you again. The wicked doth compass about the righteous. Now, yeah, you could go all the way to Revelation 20. When Satan and his forces, they compass around the New Jerusalem. Yeah, that's, that's a whole other one. And we'll get to that later as we get through the book of Habakkuk. But the one that came to my mind is in Luke chapter 19. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 19. This is really powerful. Luke chapter 19, go down to verse 43. Luke chapter 19 verse 43 it says this this is where jesus is okay jesus is coming with his disciples they're walking along they get within view of jerusalem they draw near to it and jesus begins to weep and he says to them in verse 42 he says if you had known even you especially in this your day the things that make for peace but now they are hidden from your eyes. Notice what he says. The day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee around. Compass thee around. And keep thee in on every side. And shall lay e thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. I think that is so powerful of what is happening here. Jesus is talking about the wicked that compass around thee. But when they do that, if you're a house of prayer, what is your attitude? What is, what is your response when these kinds of things happen? Hmm. You think that's words of wisdom for us today? Because it says that because of this, the eighth one, really, even though I said there are seven, you could even say there's an eighth in a way, but the eighth is connected with the seventh. And that is justice becomes perverted. So as a result of this situation of not being a house of prayer, 
of not accepting divine guidance will ultimately lead to justice becoming perverted. Bended is the Hebrew, or twisted. Let me ask you, does that sound like the world that you and I live in today? Words of wisdom, again, for us. You know, this reminds me of what happened millennia ago in the book of Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, it said the Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Where are we at today in our mindset, in our relationship? Where are we spiritually? What are we connected to? Is God in our heart? Is he leading us truly with divine guidance? How are we responding? Are we truly his disciples? I want to share with you one last thing as I close this up, as we kind of end this introduction to the book of Habakkuk. I was reading in, in one place where it says the book of Habakkuk provides a solution to the problem of why God permits sinners to flourish. Comparable to the solution provided by the book of Job, the problem of why God permits saints to suffer. Habakkuk sincerely, sincerely loved the Lord and earnestly longed for the triumph of righteousness, but he could not understand why God seemingly permitted the apostasy and crime of Judah to go unchecked and unpunished. God informs him that he has a plan for checking and punishing Judah for its evil ways, and that the Chaldeans are to be the instrument by which he will accomplish this plan. But this explanation gives rise to another problem in Habakkuk's mind. How can God use a nation more wicked than Judah to punish Judah. How can such a plan be reconciled with divine justice? I'll leave you those with those thoughts today. I want you to ponder the things that I've shared with you today that prepares you for what we will do next week. But I thank you for joining me here today. You can join me each week here as we do this midweek study, but you can also join me Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. You can see here the website at the bottom. 10 a.m. for Sabbath school time, and 11.15 for church. Pray with me now as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that you be with each of us in the times in which we live. We've seen the messages of men like Nahum. We're going to be seeing messages from Habakkuk. There have been messages from Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, so many others that have warned that if our hearts are not right with God, that there is devastation and destruction. Lord, we do not serve you out of fear. We serve you out of love. But at the same time, we must take this seriously. And Lord, I ask that in each of our lives, that as we draw near to you, that you will draw near to us. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.